Luke 14, and we'll read from verse 1 to the end of verse 11. The parable of the wedding feast, uh, verses 7 through 11, is our text for this evening. But we'll read the previous verses uh, just in order to get it in context. Luke chapter 14, reading from verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. That's a, some kind of a disease that, you know, bloats the body. Uh, and Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace, and he took him and healed him and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, <coughs> sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honourable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The Lord bless that reading of his holy word to us this evening. The way up is down. The way up. The way up to God, the way up to heaven, the way to righteousness, the way to the kingdom of God, the way up is, first of all, down. The humility of faith. We, um, just for your encouragement, before that we, we look at this parable for a few moments, some of us were preaching in uh, Nottingham on Monday. And um, a gentleman came to me. He addressed me by my first name. I didn't recognize him. Apparently we had met some years ago, um, but I, I did not recognize him. I have for, for a good number of years, uh, I put together um, a testimony, my own testimony that I put on cassette tape, and now I have on CDs. And I've given out hundreds and hundreds of them over the years. And I've often sat at home and I've pondered, I wondered, you know, <laughs> have any of them ever, ever actually done any good? Well, on Monday, this man, Mike, his name is, if you'd like to pray for him, uh, he came to me on Monday and he said that I had given, not in Nottingham, but in Stoke and Trent where I live, I had given a lady friend of his one of these cassette tapes, I showed you how long ago it was. And uh, she had passed it on to him. And he had kept it for years, uh, never listened to it. Um, but she passed away quite recently. Uh, whereupon he took the, the cassette tape and he listened to it. And the Lord blessed it to him. And now he's a believer also. So it's, you know, just um, we saw the seed uh, we don't always speak to people, you know, and um, we testify to them um, and we just don't know what, you know, the Lord will do with it. Maybe after many, many days, you know, that, that word, you know, that you, you, you read, you, you sow the seed and the bread comes back to you after many, after many days. Well, so it was on this occasion, uh, we, we've agreed to meet and have coffee together and uh, we'll see uh, just... Um, He's attending a church, and so um, we'll see um, just exactly 
how the Lord's dealt with him. So, you know, just keep sowing the seed, testifying to the Lord's grace and love, and uh, who knows what the Lord will do with it. Yeah? Don't give up. So just for a few minutes tonight, we'll just look at this parable. Uh, these Jews, uh, Pharisees and scribes and so on, uh, they were always vying for the most prominent place, you know, whether it was a feast or anywhere else, uh, just as it is here. They have, you might say, elevated opinions of themselves. That, of course, does not behold someone who is a member of God's kingdom. And that's certainly not the way to get into God's kingdom either. Um, uh, Jesus, uh, let's be clear from the, the start, Jesus is not teaching us good table manners here. That would be a social gospel. It's the gospel itself. It's the good news of salvation that, that is being proclaimed here. Uh, Jesus is looking. He's not looking for an outward show of humility. Uh, the Pharisees and scribes, the Jews, were very good at that too. It's the humility that God is looking for. It's the principle of life that belongs to members of the kingdom of God. It's an inner spiritual grace given to us, worked in us by God in regeneration when we are born again. Um, the Lord, by his spirit, awakens us to the reality of our sinfulness and we're we're not shown at all because well we just couldn't cope with that it would crush us uh, beyond belief but we're, we're shown um, we're made aware of our sinfulness and we're given a, a something of a glimpse of the greatness and the glory of God and it, it produces in us that spiritual grace of humility, which is necessary, Jesus says here in verse 11, which is necessary for entrance into the kingdom of God. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, shall be brought down. And he that humbleth himself in the humility of faith, bound before King Jesus, he, she shall be exalted. So it is vital for entry into the kingdom of God. Pride and humility are opposites. They're like oil and water, they don't mix. But the motive, notice will you, the motive of these uh, Pharisees and scribes inviting Jesus, verse one, it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day that they watched him, their motive in inviting him on this Sabbath day, think about it, a Sabbath day of the Lord, and this is their evil business. They are there and they are sitting there, not because they want him, not because they desire him to be there, not because they trust him, and, and not because they're, they're members of God's kingdom. They're there simply to watch him because they're looking for an occasion to accuse and to condemn them. They're looking for an excuse to condemn the Lord of glory. In other words, it's a setup. In modern jargon, it's a sting. They're looking to entrap the Lord Jesus Christ, who does several things here. One, he ignores them. He knows, he understands where they're coming from, and he knows what they're after, but he just, he just ignores it. He's there. It's his business to whoever they are, whatever they are, it's his business to proclaim the kingdom of God. Yeah. Another thing he does, in spite, of, in spite of what they're thinking, in spite of the accusations that they're going to make against him, he heals this man who has this terrible, this terrible affliction, this terrible disease. He heals them, and in doing so, he does something else. He exposes their sin. And that's, well, that's what Jesus does. First of all, you see, before we can come to know him and love and adore him, before we can enter into God's kingdom, this is something that God must do for us, in us. He must expose our sin because we don't know it, you know? We can, we can live the most wretched lives, the most degenerate lives, and still think, you know, I mean, it's amazing. You get a, a, a prolific drunkard or a 
drug addict, you know, and you speak to them about their sin and, and you know, what's wrong with me? You know, I, I, I'm okay, you know. They, they don't, men just don't see it. Nobody sees it. God has to reveal it to us. And Jesus is exposing. He's not just here for the man with the dropsy. He's here for the Pharisees and scribes too. And he's here for you too. To expose your sin. Yeah. So that you can see it. So not to hurt, not to harm, but so that you can get rid of it. And, and, and get sat down at the wedding feast in the right place yeah these jews you know not just the pharisees the scribes all of them you know they they gave the appearance of being holy and humble appearance appearance you know religious clothes i mean that's the problem with them isn't it whether it be a, a man or a woman with the clerical collars they call them or a muslim you know with the long robes and their their hijabs or whatever they call them you know and people look at them and they think, oh, they must be very devout, very holy people, like, you know. These men have the, these people have the appearance of being holy and of being humble, but inside, inside, in their hearts, lies the cancer, this cancer of pride, because that's what it is. It's a cancer, it's a disease, and it's in all of us. Because as King David says in Psalm 51, we are all of us, we are conceived in sin, we are born in sin, we are shapen in iniquity, we come into the world rooted with this pride in us that has to be demolished, has to be dealt with. It's the root of all sin. It's the sin that brought Satan and a host of angels down. It's manifest in those who refuse to own their true state and condition before God. It's manifest in the man or woman who simply says, no thank you, on the street, no thank you, I don't need that. Yeah. It's manifest in those who say, no, I'm not a sinner, I have never sinned, I've done nothing wrong. It's manifest in all humanity. So, the way up is down under that title, the ruin, the ruin of pride that is, the humility required, and then the reward and punishment. In relation to our fellow man, well, we see it, don't we? We see it amongst those people. Perhaps you don't walk in those domains, but, you know, you see it in those who boast of their riches, you know. Uh, some of them no longer, I mean, in days past, we used to talk about uh, with some awe, we used to talk about millionaires, now it's billionaires, you know, and, and their billions are just never enough. But what do their billions, I mean, Jesus tells us that it's very hard, not impossible, but it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Because what do the riches do? Well, they think they've gotten them by their own power, you know, and, and of course it makes them very arrogant, doesn't it? It makes them very proud, makes them very arrogant, you know. It might be, it might be monetary, you know, or it might be talents, it might be, you know, intellectual gifts, they're so clever, you know, and, and they look down upon the rest of humanity with utter disdain, you know, or position of power in authority and government maybe, you know, um, and with a contemptuous gaze an attitude of pride, they look down with utter disdain upon creatures who are, well, they, they, they deem to be lower than themselves. We see it, don't we, in those who are, you know, ruthless in, in their bid for power, you know. They maybe are in a place of power, but enough is just never enough. Whether it's riches, you know, whether it's talents, whether it's position, whether it's power, enough is just never enough. They want more and more. They're never satisfied. And of course, those in power, of course, are, are utterly and absolutely ruthless with it. They'll stamp upon, they'll step on anybody to get up higher, to get more power and more authority. This ruin, this, this ruinous pride is utterly huge. I mean, when you think of the opposite, you think of the child of the kingdom, the child of God, who walks in the humility of faith. I mean, what does what would modern psychiatry uh, think of, of such as them? 
you know. They would diagnose them as, as being mentally deficient, you know, poor, or they've, they've, got, a, they've got a crippling self-image, you know, and, and, and they would declare such to be dysfunctional. I mean, it, it just isn't, isn't the, the, the way of the world. Um, um, you know, in, in, well, you, you find it in the absolute sense, of course, the, of the unbeliever. But it's the prime mover for all other sins. It opens the way of transgression and evil. Pride, man's pride, his fallen nature. And of course, um, you know, uh, when you're dealing, when you're dealing with the world, if you're looking for a job, the world's attitude is, blow yourself up. You know, you're, you're making a, a CV, you know, you sell yourself, sell yourself. But that's not the way of the kingdom member. We know what we are before God. But of course, we have to remember that this pride is still present in us, in the children of God too. It resides, it still resides in our flesh. We're fighting all the time. In Romans 7 and verse 18, Paul says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Paul, don't get putting that on your CV, you'll never get the job. Yeah. But beloved, that's you, that, that's you and I. That's our shells. It's a major factor in our lives to the end. In fact, I... I, I I think I read it from one of the Puritans. He said it's the last, it's the very last sin to go. As we are laying in the grave, finally and fully, that pride falls away. And then you see it even, we see it even, you know, in, in, in theological terms, you know, those who think themselves able to help God to attain their salvation. You know, in Roman Catholic theology, Arminianism, in other words, you know, yes, Jesus is good, uh, but you have to add to what Jesus is and what Jesus did, you have to add your good works as well. It's like they think, you know, there's still a good spark in man, there's still that, that little bit of goodness in him that's able to perform something good and to enable and to help God to give him a lift up, to give him a leg up. It's pride. It's pride. As Paul says, you know, uh, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Conceived, born in sin, with nothing, absolutely nothing to offer God. And the new, the new obedience that's given to us in our believing lives is, is, only, is only just a small beginning, you know? We, we've got a complete salvation. There's no, no question about that. But now, down here, we only have it in principle. The actual and the fullness and consummation of it is in glory. So humility is the opposite to pride. It's an awareness. It's not just an awareness of our own state and condition, but it's an awareness of the awesomeness, the heights of God, the greatness, the, lofty, the loftiness of God. Paul says in Romans 11, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. He is the, um, um, you know, I mean, apart from sin, we are nothing. In Psalm 40, um, Isaiah says, Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as a small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. That's all the nations together. They're just like a drop in a bucket to the Almighty. So what's one single individual? And what are we with sin added to that? Fallen creatures, rebels against the most high God. We're like tiny little specks of sinful dust on the horizon of God's universe. What place has pride got in that, beloved? In your heart and mine? 
We are puny, poor, dependent creatures, falling creatures, dependent upon God every moment, every second of our lives, even for our very next breath. But added to all that, we are sinful also. We forfeited every and any right that ever a man or woman had in this world. Human rights, human rights, the source of that's pride as well, is it not? What rights do we have before Almighty God when we have sinned and come short of his glory? It's not just that we've come short of the standard that he set. We set up our own target. Huh? We set up our own standards. Deliberately and will, willfully choosing to walk in the way of rebellion against the Most High God. And worthy and entitled, the only right that we have as fallen sinful creatures, the only right that we have is to eternal death. And that's the seat, that's the seat that Jesus offers these Jews, yeah? He's not teaching them good manners. He said, this is, you want to get into the kingdom of God, here's your seat. This is the seat that you must take. And he says, likewise to you this evening, if you would enter God's kingdom, this is your place, this is your seat, the lowest place, the lowest place. Truth be known, um, we don't even deserve a place. We don't even deserve an invite to the banquet. But we are being invited. But the place is the lowest seat, not the highest. Because we don't even deserve to be at the banquet. Never mind have a seat in the place. Secondly, the humility. The context, of course, is a wedding feast, as we read. And it's a picture. The picture is, of course, of God's covenant of grace and his church's people. And, and the wedding, the wedding of, the, of the, um, the lamb and his bride. And um, they're received, received by him, received by God, and they're given... They're given a place at the marriage supper of Christ and his church, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 9, um, with his eternally blood-bought children, none of whom deserve a place. And of course, they freely recognize this in the humility of faith. They've been brought to see this, that they don't deserve to be there at the wedding, never mind have a seat at the table. And their, their humility is this consciousness of their own sin, sinfulness, of their own vileness. At 1 Timothy 1.15, uh, uh, Paul says, uh, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. That's the attitude. That's the humility that Jesus is looking for in these scribes and Pharisees, in these religious people, and in us here this evening. I don't deserve to be here at the feast. I don't deserve to have a seat here at the banquet. I deserve nothing. I deserve nothing but eternal death. But of course, that wasn't the attitude of, of the Jews, of any of them. He gives us another parable in Luke chapter 18, the two, the two men that went up to the temple. And one of them, a proud Pharisee, full of this cancerous pride, and, and he's, he's boasting before God. He's not like all of the men. He doesn't cheat people in the marketplace. He doesn't do the adultery. He doesn't do the uncleanness. He keeps God's law to the nth degree. He is so diligent in his religiosity. And he's so proud of it. But the other man won't even lift his eyes up to heaven but beats his breast and, and, and cries, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, Jesus asks a question of them, 
Which of these two do you think went home just? Justified before God, that is. You see, the humility of faith, the child of God, who's been abased by God, by the grace of God, that is, by the kindness of God, is totally amazed to find himself a guest at all. And that will be, that will be his or her place in, 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 the, in the full consummate kingdom of God. When, when, when they enter e eternal glory and, and, and some, you know, maybe some, some angel comes up to him and, and says to them, what are you, what are you doing? On what grounds are, are you here? And they, and they will answer, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't deserve to be here. I'm amazed that I am here. I close my eyes in death, and here I am in the kingdom of God with this glory. It's, it's him, him pointing to Jesus. He told me I could come. Because this child of God looks around him in the world, and he sees, he sees many, many thousands. I see it day after day, beloved. When I'm preaching on the streets, there's people walking past me, and, and, and I'm, I'm thinking, why me? Why not all of them? I see all these people excluded, and, and some of them, I, I have to be honest, some of them, are, they're better people than I am, than I'll ever be. And so the child of God finds himself at the wedding feast, not because of him or herself, because they know that they're, they're righteous, their righteousnesses are as filthy rags, they're corrupt and they're depraved. But again, of course, they don't put that on their CV. They wouldn't get the job, would they? But it's a, the mystery, you know? The mystery of the gospel. Because, you know, they, they acknowledge, I, I wasn't even looking for him. I mean, I... I I can testify to that, 36 years of age. I was when I was saved 43 years ago. And, and I, I wasn't looking for him. It was he that came to me. You see, the gift, the grace, that's what the word grace means, gift. The wages of sin is death. But the gift, the grace, the free grace of God is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it comes to us as a result of him humbling himself. That's how it can be offered to you tonight. That's how you can be invited to the feast tonight. Because he's made the way possible. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Humbling himself to the point of death. 2 Corinthians 8 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, rich beyond anything, anything this world knows. Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. That is, that you might be exalted. Yeah. He took our nature. He took our guilt. He took our shame. He took our sin. He took our curse. He took our wrath. Condemned as a criminal, a pariah. The humility, the humility of faith is rooted in his work, in what, what he has done for us, and rooted in his work of regenerating us, our being born again, the Spirit of God working in us, this grace of humility in our hearts and so that thereafter we walk by faith in the humility of faith with Jesus as our pattern for for walking in humility in John 13 he says and if I then your Lord and master have washed your feet ye also ought to wash one another's feet 
For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happier ye if you do them. And again, Philippians 2 and verse 5. Beloved in Christ, there is no place for a hierarchy amongst us in the church. There is no place for pride. If you've got spiritual gifts, if you've got gifts of intellect, if you've got gifts that you can use for the furtherance of the gospel and the work of the church, what have you got to boast about? Who makes a man to differ? You've got a better theological understanding than somebody else. Who gave it to you? God gave it to you. No place. No place for pride in the kingdom of God. There's no seat. There at the banquet for such pride. But then thirdly and finally, the reward and punishment. Verse 11, for whosoever exalteth him shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The Pharisees, they claim to have a high place in the house of God. But the truth was the very opposite. They were excluded. They had an elevated self-opinion, an elevated self-confidence. And Jesus says in another place, he says that harlots and publicans, tax collectors, they're more, more noble than you. They'll enter into the kingdom of God and they'll sit down in the kingdom with Abraham and you'll be cast out. I saw, I saw a, 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 an experience of that, you know, I was preaching in America just... Um, just a couple of months ago, and we were preaching at, uh, at Yale, that famous university, the one that Jonathan Edwards attended many years ago. It's somewhat different now. But we, when we were in, in Yale, we, we preached in two places. We preached at the university, where we were met with nothing but arrogance and disdain. Uh, people looking at us with just utter disgust, like we just crawled out from under their feet. And then we went down to the bus stop where all the poor people hang out, the homeless people. And you know, we couldn't give enough Bibles away. We couldn't give enough New Testaments away. Uh, we just couldn't stop talking to people about Jesus. The same pride, the same arrogance, the same disdain. But because of the Christ, because of Christ, because of the cross, Proud is, pride is, is, is a disgrace and in us, beloved, before we can enter the kingdom of God, it has to go, it has to be, we have to be humbled, we have to be abased. I mean, think, think of Peter, you know, his pride, you know, he, boast, he, he boasted to the Lord, you know, he says, I, I want for these, all these guys, they might forsake you, he said, but, but me, never. He had to come down. He was so full of himself, self-confidence, pride, the same pride. Glorying in his own power, his own strength. Pride, the proverb says, goes before a fall. How we need to pray, beloved, the Lord enable us to walk in this humility of faith. Lord, remove any blindness from me. Cause me to, to know myself. I, I think as John Calvin says that, that self-knowledge is a prerequisite to knowing the Lord, to knowing God. Knowing ourselves, knowing what we are in reality. Not, not, not that self-elevated opinion, but knowing ourselves as God sees us, conceived and born in sin. The wicked, they exalt themselves. And time and time again, God, we, we see it. You know, God, God brings them down. Sometimes he brings them in and gives them over to, to deeper and more sin until they're th thoroughly and utterly abased. Times we see it in society, you know, when men are exalted, you know, and, um, and they use their power, they use their gifts, intellect and monetary and all the rest of it 
They use it in the service of Satan and the service of sin, and we think, we think that they've gotten away with it. But they haven't. Sometimes the punishment is not complete in this life. They're not brought to an end of themselves, and they're not brought to see that they have no right to a seat at the table of the Lord. In Matthew 7, 22, Jesus says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied, prophesied in thy name? Oh, Lord, I, I've done these wonderful things. All my life long, I've done all these things for you. And in thy name, we, we, I, we, I, I've cast out devils. And in thy name, done many, many wonderful works. And he will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Eternally consigned to weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the humble are profoundly aware that they have come through the cross, through the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, who humbled himself to death and that they have no right even to be at the banquet, never mind to have a seat there. In earth, they were despised and they were rejected of men just as their Savior was, but exalted, lifted up out of the dunghill by God himself. They claim their righteousness is to be as filthy rags, but he says, he says to them, enter into the joy of your Lord. Exaltation, one day to be exalted before all those who despised and hated and rejected them in this world. Their faith derided and mocked treated as the offscoring of society, even chased out of the world, murdered and slaughtered even by, even by religious men who think they are doing God a favor. I heard the report last, last Sunday afternoon, a, a bragging, a boasting a declaration by Islamic State in northern Nigeria how that they had slaughtered 190 Christians in the space of two months, June and July. And they cry, Allah Akbar, great is God. They think they do that in God's name. But for the humble, Theirs will be the highest. Theirs will be the highest seat in glory. They will sit down at the feast with the Lamb and through all eternity. They will acknowledge, no, I don't deserve to be here. Not because of me. Not because of anything I did. They give all the glory to the Lamb, to Christ and his work on the cross, his grace, his kindness, his merciful kindness. See, it's not, that, it's not that Jesus is telling these men that they shouldn't be at the feast. Oh, they should. It's not, it's not that Jesus is saying to you here this evening that you shouldn't be at the feast. Oh, you should. And it's not that you shouldn't even have a, a seat. Yes, you should. But the way you have to understand, the way, the way up, the way into the rightness, the righteousness of God, the way into the kingdom of God, the way up is down. In the humility of faith, with a humble childlike faith, except you be converted, says Jesus, and become as children, as little children, little toddlers. You know what they're like. You know, whatever an adult says to them, they, they, they just take them at their word. Well, you have to do the same with Jesus, just simply and humbly, like a little child, take him at his word. Because except you become as a little child and be converted, you shall in no wise enter 
the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus says that you must be born again. By the grace of God, operating in us through the preaching of the gospel, revealing to us, giving us an understanding, awakening us to the reality by his spirit, awakening us to the reality of our sinful state and condition. And in seeing it, instead of rebelling against it, instead of arguing, instead of fighting, seeing, made aware of your true state and condition in the humility of faith, yeah? You acknowledge that sin. And in the way of repentance, you turn from it and you cast yourself upon Jesus, upon the king of the kingdom, the master of the banquet, the one who invites you to, offers you a place at the table. Come, come, he says, you come, come, come one and all, come each and every one of you here tonight. Yeah? Do you understand how it is that you come? Not lifting yourself up, not in pride. You come in the way that childlike humility of faith, trusting no longer in yourself, anything in you or anything you have. Nothing in my hand I bring, Lord Jesus Christ. Simply to you and your cross I claim. That's the way up. That's the way in. That's the way to get a seat at the banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Repent and believe the gospel for the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen. Let's um, sing then as we come to a close this evening, number 594. 594. Show pity, Lord, O Lord, forgive. Let a repenting rebel live. Are not thy mercies large and free? May not a sinner trust in thee? Yes, is the answer to that question. Yes.